How is it that society seems to hold two diametrically opposed stereotypes about aging at the same time? Old people are cognitively impaired and too frail to do much of anything. Or, conversely, they are the wise owls who've gained the insight of the ages. The former is probably more prevalent than the latter, but should it be? With us now to consider all of that, let's welcome, in Los Angeles, California, Daniel Levitin, the James McGill Professor Emeritus of Neuroscience and Music at McGill University and the author of Successful Aging, a Neuroscientist Explores the Power and Potential of Our Lives. In Austin, Texas, Allison Sekuler, the Sandra A. Rotman Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience at the Rotman Research Institute and President and Chief Scientist at the Baycrest Academy for Research and Education. And here in the downtown of our provincial capital, Natasha Raja. She is Professor of Psychology at Toronto Metropolitan University and Canada Research Chair in Sex, Gender and Diversity in Brain Health, Memory and Aging. And have we got the right three for this discussion today. Welcome everybody, it's great to have you on TVO tonight. Daniel, to you first, when it comes to the brain and old age, the standard story is it's a story of decline. You forget things. You cognitively slow down. Is that the whole story? Well, to begin with, slow isn't necessarily bad. We know from the work of Daniel Kahneman and others that slow, deliberate cognitions tend to be more accurate than snap judgments. Another part of the story is that older adults show increases in impulse control. So if there's a a red button lying around that might launch a war, you want to have good impulse control. Uh, older adults tend to be better at empathy and problem solving. They see the big picture faster and better. Uh, not every older adult. These are, these are statistical uh, averages. Understood. All right, Allison, what would you add to that? It sounds like the answer to the question, though, is that's not the full story. What would you add? It's not... Yeah, I'd say it's absolutely not the full story, and, and there's there's really trade-offs. So you might get slower at some things, you might get faster at other things, and you're also accumulating more and more and more knowledge throughout your lifetime, and you're better able to sort of integrate all of that together and understand how, as, as Daniel said, the big picture kind of fits together. So we've actually done studies in our lab where we've done experiments showing not even just, you know, in, in, in sort of the metaphorical terms of the big picture, but in physical terms, the big picture. Sometimes older people can actually see, they don't actually see the fine details as well, but they can see the big picture better and they respond to that big picture faster. So it's definitely not just a story of a decline. And we also know that the older brain can rewire itself in some ways to, to compensate for weaknesses as we're getting older. So there's a lot of what's called plasticity in the brain. Um, so as some parts might start to not work as well, other parts can take over. So it's not just an all or nothing um, headed toward decline story anymore. And we have talked to Norman Deutsch on this program about that very subject. Natasha, let's, let's do the deeper dive here on one of the age-old stereotypes, which is our memory definitely gets worse as we get older. True or false? It depends will be my answer, because memory is not this unified construct that people think of. There's many types of memory, many different types of memory systems and different brain regions that are implicated in our ability to form and do mnemonic tasks or memory tasks. So I think when people think that memory declines with age, what they're thinking about is episodic memory, a type of memory system that's dependent on the hippocampus and the frontal lobes and our ability to recollect past experiences in rich detail. So, you know, what did you have for breakfast yesterday or three days ago? Things like that. People, you know, when they can't remember that, they're like, oh, my memory is declining. But that's not the only type of memory. Um, our memory for facts and knowledge um, actually might increase with age as we get more and more exposure and day-to-day -day life experiences. Our implicit memory, so our memory for learning how to, you know, play the piano, our ability to swim, all those kinds of memories remain relatively intact in healthy aging. So it's not as though all forms of memory decline. Some types do decline, and they start to decline much earlier in midlife. So it's not an older adult-only situation. And they're influenced by many factors, such as stress, attention ability. So it's not necessarily a memory problem that you're seeing either. I'm going to come back to that notion of it doesn't only happen once you become a septuagenarian or octogenarian. It actually happens earlier. But, but following up, actually, from what you just said here, and Daniel, I'll go to you on this. If you're dealing with somebody who forgets a name or can't come up with a word, which is something, you know, utterly universal, 
How much should we read into that in terms of whether it's representative of an overall cognitive decline? I, I think one of the things to recognize, I, I'm in the wonderful position of being a university professor, as you know, and so I see a new crop of 19 and 20 year olds every year. And let me tell you, they have memory problems. They forget <laughs> names, they forget where their classroom is, they forget their, they lose their phones and their car keys. One of the things that diff is different is that if you're 20 and you lose your cell phone, the story you tell yourself is, well, I've got a lot on my plate, or I didn't get enough sleep last night, or I had too much to drink. When you're 75, the same thing happens, and the story is, oh my God, it's Alzheimer's. This is the end. <laughs> same behavior, different narrative. Let me read this. We're gonna continue here with a, a quote from an article published by Harvard Medical School. Uh, as it relates to what we've been discussing. And here we go. As we age, connections between distant brain areas strengthen. These changes enable the aging brain to become better at detecting relationships between diverse sources of information, capturing the big picture, and understanding the global implications of specific issues. Perhaps this is the foundation of wisdom. It is as if with age, your brain becomes better at seeing the entire forest and worse, at seeing the leaves. Okay, let's look into that. Natasha, do you like that analogy? So I do like that analogy, but I do want to like, give a caveat there as well. I think, um, you know, when you, like, I'm a neuroimaging uh, specialist, and so when you do neuroimaging studies, you do see some structural uh, disconnections in the white matter. So there is, it's not all connectivity remains uh, with aging, and but there is a lot of variability, individual variability. Um, but I do agree that in the functional imaging world, what we see is with age, there's a greater generalization in the networks that are engaged to do a wide variety of uh, different types of tasks. And so this generalization reflects both this ability, higher efficiency to maybe process things that have similarity, but with it, there are always costs to the benefits. And so there's also the cost of perhaps not being as flexible and fluid in being able to fl uh, fluctuate between tasks. So yes, you are more efficient. You might be able to see the, the forest for the trees, but when the trees matter, you might not be able to switch to focusing just on the trees. Ah, interesting. Okay, Daniel, can I get you to follow up on that in terms of whether you like that analogy of the forest and the trees and whether it makes sense to you? I think what the imaging studies show is, is uh, just what we've, we've heard is that uh, there is some white matter degradation. There's degradation of gray matter. White matter are the links between the computational hubs, the processing centers that are the, uh, the gray matter. Um, I think the central point here is that good decision making results from being able to see patterns. And if nothing else, humans evolved to be great pattern detectors, great predictors of what's gonna come next. And the more information you have, the more accumulated experience of things that you've uh, seen and um, well, experiences that you've had, the easier it is to draw a connection between them. And that's what Harvard is talking about. The connections between disparate ideas become strengthened and more accessible to an older adult. I, I give an example of radiology. Radiology is pattern matching. If, if you go in for an x-ray and you are afraid that you might have a tumor, you want a 75-year-old radiologist reading the slide, not a 28-year-old. You want somebody who has seen it all and is able to quickly form an accurate judgment. Well, can I follow up on that? Okay, 75 versus 29. What would you rather have, though, 85 or 40? I think it depends. Oh, it really <laughs> depends, Steve. So. There, there are some people who are not doing well after 80 or 85. There are people not doing well after 60. That happens. But I look to the models. Uh, the Dalai Lama, age 88, I met him when he was 84, and he had just published his 125th book. Uh, that's a picture of us together on the wall. Uh, Jane Goodall at 89, um, who uh, is still carrying a... a a very complicated and vigorous tour schedule, trying to recruit, recruit young adults to become more concerned about climate awareness. And look at David Suzuki at 87, still hosting the nature of things brilliantly, which he's done since 1979. Hmm. I know you're all dying to have me ask you the question that you think I'm going to ask you, 
but I'm not going to ask that yet. I'm holding off on that question. We're going to get to some other things first. And maybe, you know what, Allison, maybe you want to, maybe you want to bring your dad's example into this, maybe you don't, but what do you, what do you think your dad at 84 is, is better at now than he might have been at uh, 28? My, my dad is actually a lot better at interacting with human beings <laughs> than he was when he was younger because he's learned, again, it's pattern recognition. You sort of, you learn what it is that's going to um, help help you interact with people in the right way to spark conversations. He has a lot of stories. He's always been funny. I think he's just getting funnier and funnier as he's going on. So you definitely want to take his class if you have a chance to. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think he's also become more creative. Uh, there's There's some, you know, ideas around decreased inhibition and increased creativity uh, that are floating around these days. And that's it is one of the things we think happens as you get older is that some of the inhibitory mechanisms may be declining. But we also think that's one of the reasons that you can see the bigger picture better. And it, we think it may also be making people more creative. So um, and I just have to tell a, a very quick story about David Suzuki, because we had him in our lab a couple of years ago, right before pandemic. And uh, we were doing a test with him where normally what we see is um, if somebody is walking and talking at the same time, their walking slows down. So we tried to do this for the nature of things for special we were doing with him. And we said, okay, walk. And we, we saw how fast he was walking. And then we said, okay, now David, name as many animals as you can think of while you're walking. And he actually sped up. So it's, it's definitely not the case that, you know, <laughs> aging is going to affect everybody in exactly the same way. Well, Okay, I'm going to indulge the three of you here. Let's go here now, because, of course, not only is the upcoming presidential race in the United States uh, the first rematch in a century, more than a century, between two, a, a, a current president and an ex-president, uh, but it's also the oldest matchup in American history. And I guess, well, we know that the polls th say that people think, the vast majority of people think Joe Biden at age 81 today is too old to serve for another term. And we know that uh, 66 per, or 62 percent, rather, people think Donald Trump, who was 77, is also too old to have another go around. It is true that Joe Biden from time to time can look somewhat frail, although he sure didn't at the State of the Union the other night. And Donald Trump from time to time can say the most nonsensical, disgraceful things. So the question I guess I want the three of you to tackle is, how old is too old to be president of the United States? Go ahead, Allison. So I just put my cards on the table. I'm a dual citizen, so I actually will be voting uh, in the upcoming election. Uh, and um, I won't say, you know, what way I vote, but the there is no answer to that question. It really, as we've been hearing, it depends is the answer. There's so many individual differences. I would rather have, you know, a 90-year-old, a 110-year-old if it's a certain person than I would have a 45-year-old if it's somebody else. Um, I'd rather have someone who's got experience as long as long as that particular person is still able to make the right kinds of decisions and as Dan said before you know sometimes being slow doesn't mean that your brain is slow it just means that you're being thoughtful um, and you've got a lot of information you're you're integrating and you see this even in young kids I mean so young kids sometimes have different um, uh, diagnoses of, of being uh, slower to process information. But sometimes the, the people who are slowest to process information are actually the most intelligent because they've got so much information in their heads that they're trying to integrate that it takes them a while to come up with the right answer. I would rather wait and come up with the right answer than than not. So in, I'm, in looking at how old is too old, uh, there is no answer. And I think the other thing to point out when people say that this is the oldest race is you have to look at age relative to life expectancy. Yeah. So we had early on a number of presidents in their 60s. That was pretty much the end of life back then. Now our life expectancy is a lot longer. So even if someone's in their 70s or 80s, they're not actually as as old uh, in, the, in the context of society as some of our presidents have been in the past. That's a great point. Everything is relative. Okay, Natasha, same to you. How old is too old to be president? So I like what Allison said, I think it really depends. There's a lot of individual variability. And I also think the person's disposition and their ability to rely on others and take in information from others um, and manage their emotions and behave not uh, impulsively, those are factors that are just as important as how quickly you are to react to things and things like 
right? Things that we were talking about earlier about speed and intelligence. Like I think it really is about can you consider others' opinions and take that into account and build off of your own richness of experience to make decisions that are sound and considerate. Does it seem to you that either one of these candidates can do that? No, no, never mind. That's a political science question. <laughs> no, that's not a clinical question. Okay. Daniel, I should give you the last word on this. Uh, I, I, I don't want to assume that you're going to make it unanimous, but I got a feeling you are. <laughs> I'd rather make it anonymous than unanimous. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that science, Steve, I believe that science exists as a public trust and it should be apolitical. Science just is. It should be for everyone, for people of all political beliefs. So I don't really like the question, but uh, how old is too old? But I would say that um, I think many, I'm a dual citizen also, many of us in the United States would like to see younger candidates. The system is sort of rigged towards incumbents. It's hard to get started when you're younger. It's hard to raise funds. And so we're stuck with what we have. Uh, and I think the advantage of younger candidates is that they uh, are, they tend to look forward with a longer event horizon. They, t they tend to have uh, more, I would say, uh, tend to have more creative ideas in general. Uh, but I think another important factor in this particular election is ask yourself not who the commander in chief is going to be and only that question, but what kind of team are they going to assemble? If they can assemble a team, a cabinet, and other advisors who are um, intelligent and compassionate and can solve problems and move the country in the direction you want it to move, that's the person to vote for because we exist in a system where it's not an autocrat, it's, it's a team. Well, one so of the more amusing be the best things... Team builder? Right. One of the more amusing things about this race is that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is considered the youth candidate, and he's 70. So, I don't know, maybe Allison's right. we got to reevaluate everything here. Uh, Daniel Levitin, Natasha Raja, Allison Sekuler, it's really good of all three of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thank you, and as we say in Cook County, Chicago, to two of you anyway, vote early, vote often. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.